Uh, greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. John 8, 12, Jesus said, he was the, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is indeed that light of life in this world of darkness. Just a quick little update. Um, sorry, I've been neglecting everybody with... Uh, yeah, I've been working. Well, I found a job, a decent paying job too. It's, it pays okay. I uh, got a good boss. I like him a lot. And uh, they hired a old guy like me in his mid 60s. So uh, they were either hard up or, uh, well, something, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, you know, so I'm thrilled to death. Go. You know, I don't really want to go back to work, but uh, the way the uh, inflation's been going because the uh, uh, the monopoly money they've been printing, you know, what can I tell you? And I had a suspension for a while there because you know who uh, doesn't like many of the things that I say. So what can I tell you? But... Uh, just so you know, I, you know, people send me articles and I got to decide if I post this, will it get my channel banned? But then I have to think about, you know, got to feed the flock, got to warn the flock. I mean, they're not my flock, they're flock of Christ, but you know, and uh, I got, I do my own research. Uh, Russia today, a year ago, was really excellent with stories, but they're, uh, I guess they, you know, the Go Yim uh, were learning too much, so they, uh, they got rid of the USA News, well, the news in the United States. They had a U.S. section, and they had a lot of stories that the national news wouldn't cover, and I guess they thought we were learning too much, so they got rid of it. I was like really disappointed. So, yeah, but I, I you know, got to do my own research and I try to find um, news stories. Plus, uh, you know, I try to answer all my emails. I try to, I really do. Um, but if I answer emails, it kind of takes away from my uh, Bible studies, but you know what? Uh, 1,500 Bible studies plus, and a lot of them, almost all of them are at least 30 minutes. Most, well, I don't know about most, but many of them are an hour long. So, yeah, I, I got a lot of stuff out there, and they're dinging me for my old studies, my old stuff. And it's a shame that you got to, um, you know, <laughs> uh, talking code just to be able to keep your channel. I sent somebody a private audio and I posted it on YouTube because it was too big to send by uh, email. And they flagged it for Med D Cole. Miss information, and I got a suspension for it. And neither she nor I remembers saying anything about uh, med d call anything. So, all I know is the month of July is aptly named. Uh, Say it. It's two syllables. July. Say it slowly. July. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Think about it. That's boy. Is that aptly named or what? So, all right. Well, with that being said, let's uh, let's go back to Judas scepter and Joseph's birthright. Um. 
But yeah, please forgive me. I've been going back to work. I mean, full time and overtime, and uh, I'm tired. You know, I thought for sure I was going to be able to retire, and and between my social security and my tiny little city pension uh, would be enough. You know, until gas went to five dollars a gallon, and uh, yeah, it's you, know, you all know. And those of you that have helped me financially, thank you. But you know, I I don't do this for money, and I don't beg for money. You know, you everybody I know is poor like me. You know, I mean, I had enough to get by on, but you know, when gas was two something a gallon, but five a gallon, and everything's going up. It's it's insane, as you know. Well, they're just printing money. You know, people think inflation is the cost of goods going up. No, it's not. It's the value of the paper that they print that they call money going down. I mean, let's face it. If you, every time you print and you double the money supply, the money's worth half as much. And they've done that a number of times. So, do you even know what the the legal the legal definition of a dollar? Do you know what the legal definition of a dollar is? The legal definition of a dollar is one ounce of ninety percent pure silver. When Clinton was president, I was buying one ounce uh, silver coins, ninety nine point nine percent pure for five dollars that same coin that my uh, dad's wife stole along with a lot of other things that I had um, is now worth about I think the spot price of gold is between 20 and 25 dollars an ounce so since Clinton was president um, the value of the dollar has gone down by what, like 250% or something like that? Or no, more than that. No, like 400% or 500%, I don't know. I was never any good at math. But when you could buy something for five bucks and now it's like 25, yeah, they're just printing money. And it's gonna crash. And uh, hey, we got a solution. Problem, reaction, solution yeah we're gonna we're gonna give you a digital digital currency mark of the beast 666 probably in your right head right hand or you're in your forehead yeah no more uh no more identity theft and uh, no more stealing you can't steal people's money anymore you know they'll have to go to the grocery store to, to rob people in the parking lot if they want to you know and uh yeah they'll they'll tout it with a lot of good things no more identity theft uh, the illegal drug trade will be over because what are people going to do you know if they got to scan their hand to buy a bag of weed or meth or whatever they i don't know you know they're going to tout it as a good thing no more tax evasion of course the ultra wealthy they don't they don't pay taxes. No, uh, uh no. Everything they do is a tax break. So, yeah. So that's the uh, that's the update. Today is July first, twenty twenty two. So, with that in mind, well, let's just do this. Well, let's keep reading. Let's just read. All right, this is, uh, uh, gee, what is this? Oh, this is the second part, part two of the scepter or the promise of a perpetuated house, throne and kingdom to David. Ought ye, ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom 
over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant, if salt. Hmm, I don't know where that comes from, but it's in the book. All right, this is chapter one of part two. The Scepter and the Davidic Covenant. There is no question that those who have followed us thus far, that the birthright people have been cast out into an unknown and faraway country, which when they entered was an uninhabited and unexplored wilderness. While Israel has been exploring, pioneering, and settling this wilderness, the Lord has so hedged up their way so that they can find neither the pass by which they came nor the place from whence they came. Although lost, insofar as their national identity is concerned, they are in the place where the Lord has said they shall find grace and where he has promised to speak comforting words to their hearts in the wilderness. Bob's note here. Remember the story of Robin Hood in Sherwood Forest? England used to be forests, but guess what? England, uh, for uh, decades, if not centuries, had the largest navy in the world. And what did they make the ships out of? Wood. They cut down all the trees. It used to be a wilderness. You know, sure. Robin Hood and Sherwood Forest, right? Well, there ain't no forest there anymore. It's gone. Uh, you know, America was a wilderness when it was first settled here. Doesn't look like it much anymore, especially when, you know, New York City and Los Angeles, Chicago, and all the other cesspools. So... Although lost, insofar as their national identity is concerned, they are in the place where the Lord has said they shall find grace and where he has promised to speak comforting words to their hearts in the wilderness. There we will leave them to fulfill their appointed destiny of becoming a multitude of nations. And Bob's note here, one little nation over in the Middle East is not fulfill the promises made to Abraham, the father of many nations. One is not many. So either God lied or pastors are liars. You take your pick. Let God be true, but every man a liar, and that includes me. While we follow the history of the scepter and learn what the word of the Lord has revealed concerning his present and its future for if god has been true to his word unless the faith of abraham isaac and jacob has become of no effect then the scepter as well as the birthright has not only a present existence but a glorious future when god made the covenant to abram in which he made him prospectively the father of many nations thereby changing his name to Abraham, he gave him the promise, kings shall come out of thee. Also, when the promise concerning the multiplicity of nations was reiterated to his wife, whose former name was Sarai, but now Sarah, or princess, it was said, kings of nations shall be of her. Thus, by the choice or election of God, were they made not only the progenitors of a race, which was to develop into many nations, which were to spread abroad to the north, south, east, and west, but also a royal family. This, of course, includes a scepter, the emblem and sign of royalty. These promised blessings given by the Lord and confirmed by to Abraham by an oath were received by him in faith and counted as though they were already in existence for the simple reason that 
when a thing is promised by the Lord and received by anyone in faith, that thing must eventually materialize because faith is the God-given force or power which will and must eventually bring promised things into existence. Hence, both the birthright and the scepter blessing passed from Abraham to Isaac as a real inheritance, while he in turn bestowed them upon Jacob, who so much desired them and considered them so surely to exist already that he was willing to strike bargains for them or even resort to fraudulent measures to get possession of them. Bob's note here. Uh, Jacob did as his mother said. His mother had more sense than his father wanting to bless Esau, somebody that God hated. Oh, God doesn't hate Esau. Read Malachi 1, where he promises, and Obadiah, where he promises the destruction of Esau. So let's keep reading. At the death of Jacob, these two covenant blessings, the birthright and the scepter, were separated. The birth, birthright falling to one of his sons and the scepter to another one of them. As we have heretofore fully explained, when Jacob, at the time of his death, while acting under the direction of the Holy Spirit, gave the scepter blessing to Judah, Bob's note, Judah was the tribe of the kings. Uh, Christ was reckoned by Joseph's line. Uh, Joseph was of the tribe of Judah. Mary was of the tribe of Levi, the, 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 uh, the priest tribe. And although their DNA was not used, if you reckon their lineages, it's a merging of the priesthood and the kings. Think about that. Yeah. I think I did a video on that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, if you hit my playlist on uh, You Know Who Tube, um, uh, it's the playlist, you know, Who is Jesus or something like that. Uh, it's a whole thing about Christ, how he was man, how he was God uh, in the flesh, king, prophet, priest, king. Yeah, all the above. Do you realize Christ is a, came here as a servant to die for his sheep? Yeah, yeah. And yet he's king and Lord. That could preach. I could make a study out of that one if I haven't already. So, yeah, think about it. So, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus told the disciples, ye are my friends. I don't know if that included uh, Iscariot, but yeah. All right, let's... Uh, da -da 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 -da. All right, uh, the prophecy which he gave with it was, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And Shiloh is where they get the word, uh, where the you-know-who say, Shalom means peace. And, uh, and who was the lawgiver? Moses. Moses was the lawgiver. God gave Moses the law, the Ten Commandments. Moses was not of Judah. Moses was of the tribe of Levi, the priests. They were the minister doing the Lord's work, the tabernacle, the temple. That was their job. The king was the civil ruler. When people had a controversy, they would go before the king. Remember when uh, the two women were arguing over a child and they went to Solomon 
And Solomon says, well, cut the child in half and give each half to the two women saying it, the child is theirs. And the mother said, oh, no, 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 please don't do that. Give the child to her. And the uh, non-mother said, no, 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 divide the child, do it. Solomon knew who the mother was instantly. Personally, if it had been up to me, the, the woman that said divide the child, I would have had her head cut off But uh, for doing that. But I don't know. Maybe Solomon had more mercy than I did. I, don't, I would have. But I'm not the king. So. All right. Let's keep reading. After the Abrahamic covenant. Oh, and uh, by the way, I've got a, an entire series on abraham and the cup and the covenants an entire playlist probably 12 14 15 hours of studies if you're interested you know and like i mentioned before go to my community page download my studies i you know one day i'm not gonna be here on youtube i don't copyright anything it's all to the glory of the lord and I hope I'm doing what he wants me to do. But yeah, copy everything. And if you want to post it somewhere, do it. I, I, it's not copyrighted. I don't. I don't copyright anything. So. All right. Uh, do, 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 do. After the Abrahamic covenant, pe had, uh, people had cried down the divine theocracy, rejecting the Lord as their king and insist on having a human king, uh, God chose Saul. Although Saul was not of the royal line, but a Benjamite, he was permitted to reign for the Lord had determined to give the people the desire of their hearts. And I did a Bible study on that too. God's feelings were hurt. They didn't want the Lord as king. God fought their battles for them. He threw down hailstones from heaven to kill the enemy army. And they didn't, you know, they, we don't want the Lord as king. No, no, we want a human king. You can read that in the book of Samuel. God said, well, okay. But let me tell you what. He's going to draft your sons and your daughters. Your sons are going to be fighting battles. Your daughters are going to be his cooks and bakers. He's going to take your best of your lands. And he's going to tax you to death. And that's the Bob paraphrase version. And uh, when he does all that, don't cry to me because I'm not going to listen to you. That's the Bob translation, by the way. So, although Saul was not of the royal line, but a Benjamite, he was permitted to reign. For the Lord had determined to give the people the desire of their hearts. But after the downfall of that haughty Benjamite, then came David, a son of the royal family, was enthroned. And to him was reiterated the promises concerning the royal family, which had been emphasized to Judah by his dying father when he bestowed on him the covenant blessing of royal fatherhood. When the scepter covenant was confirmed to David, the Lord gave the message through Nathan the prophet in these words. Bob's note here. This is why it's so important to read the Old Testament, people. The whole Bible is your book. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation chapter 22. Uh, it's all your book. And anybody that doesn't bother to read the Old Testament deserves to be deceived. They really do. You know, I, what can I tell you? I had so many people try to talk me out of reading the Old Testament when I was real young in the faith, about 30 years ago or so. Oh, don't read that Old Testament. That's for the you-know-whos. That's not our book. That's their book. Our book is the New Testament. Yeah. Try reading a, the last 
two or three chapters of a novel and, and see if you understand. No, you won't. You won't understand. You know? They're idiots. I, I know now that they were sent of Satan to, uh, to, yeah, to deceive me. So, yep. So, get the uh, Alexander Scorby, S-C-O-U-R-B-Y, um, on CD or USB drive or whatever and listen to the Bible in your car driving to and from the work or on trips or whatever. Or at home. Turn your television off. Listen to the Bible instead. You'd be surprised how much you'll learn in such a short period of time. I mean, I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm just some guy that's read the Bible a couple times and listened to it a couple times. You know? Pray for understanding. James chapter 1. When the scepter covenant was confirmed to David, the Lord gave the message through Nathan the prophet in these words. When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten, chasten him with the rod of men, but my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from uh, before thee. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Second Samuel chapter 7, 12 through 16. Bob's note here. Uh, Solomon started off really good. Uh, he was David's son. He built the temple, the original temple. And started off really, really good. Then he married, oh, I don't know, 300 and something wives and 700 and something concubines. Um, I mean, if you were, think about it, if you were a... Um, full of energy 20-year-old guy and you could uh, service three women a day. I'm trying not to be crude here, but uh, it would take you a year to go through all your wi uh, wives and concubines. Yeah, think about it. I mean, you know. And he married women who were of the satanic seed line and they got him into satan type worship uh you know and the lord was really displeased however at the end of his life he uh let's see i think yeah he wrote proverbs and ecclesiastes and he realized how worthless uh that th those heathen satanic wives that he married leading him astray to worship false, you know, the false gods and idols and all that other stuff. So he realized at the end of his life. And God said that he would pardon him. We just read that, you know, we just read that. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established before forever before thee thy throne shall be established forever all right so david was so impressed with the magnitude of this prophecy and with the period of time which it covered that he went in and sat before the lord pondering over it until in wonderment he exclaimed who am i o lord god and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto and this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, i.e. the present power, glory, and prestige of David's house, throne, and kingdom. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord, o Lord God? 2 Samuel 7, 18 and 19. No, it is not the manner of men to prophesy concerning things for a great while to come. 
but it is the manner of God. Yes, and it is the manner of God to make good that which he has spoken. David understood this, so he prayed, And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. If it is possible that there can be such power put into written words as shall yet come from that voice, which shall sound the seven thunders, we pray that it may be put into those which record the above facts, and thus compel our readers to see that it is not the spiritual throne, the spiritual scepter, the spiritual house, nor the heavenly kingdom that are therein spoken of, but that it is the literal physical throne, the earthly kingdom, and the lineal house of the um, Davidic family, which are the subjects of the prophecy, and that they are to endure forever. Bob's note here. If there's no line of King David uh, a throne on this earth today, God's a liar. And I don't think he is. And like I've mentioned before in this series, I believe Germany is Judah, or at least parts of it. All the royal houses of, of Europe were, most of them were of Germanic extraction. Yeah. Matter of fact, the king of Mexico, was it, I think, uh, I think there was a time the king of Mexico was German. Maximilian? I'm not sure. I don't know. But there, you know, look at all the, kings of Europe in the times past they were all they were all related the king of England the king the kaiser of germany the king of germany and the king of russia were cousins yeah king george who the colonists of the us fought against was german he wasn't even english i hear king george the 1st didn't even speak english spoke german the king of england spoke german Seriously. But they want you to think, uh, yeah, never mind. You know, I have no use for uh, uh, most pastors. I imagine a lot of them are going to end up in hell, which is fine with me. So, you know. You know, people, let me tell you something. When I got out of the Bible college, I wanted to be a Bible teacher at a Christian so-called school, high school or something. But you got to sell your soul to Babylon. You got to sell your soul to the devil. And um, mine is not mine to sell. It's already been paid for. So what can I tell you? All right, let's keep reading. Yeah, I would have loved to, but yeah, they don't want they don't want people like me. You know, TBN, TBN. They want TBN type preachers, where they could preach tithe, the tithe, the tithe. Oh, you got to tithe, uh, tithes and offerings. God will curse you if you don't tithe. Yeah, open your wallet and. Yeah, never mind. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servants and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. If it be possible that there can be such power put into written words as shall yet come from that voice which shall sound the seven thunders, we pray that it may be put into those which record the above facts and thus compel our readers to see that it is not the spiritual throne, the spiritual scepter, the spiritual house, nor the heavenly, uh, nor the heavenly kingdom, that which are therein spoken of, but that it is the literal throne, the literal physical throne, the earthly kingdom, and the lineal line of the 
Davidic family, which are the subjects of the prophecy and that they are to endure forever. There is also in this prophecy a note of warning to David's successor that is given in the following. If he committed iniquity, you know, sin, I will chasten him with the rod of men. It is not at all presumable that the ruler sitting on the spiritual throne and holding the scepter over the heavenly kingdom would commit iniquity. Hence, no such a threat could have been given with reference to him. But when it is applied to Solomon, the immediate successor of his father David and to others of the royal line, it is altogether another question. For many of them were as wicked as men ever get to be. Further, this prophecy was to go into effect when David's days were fulfilled, and when the son who should be set up after him would build a house for God. Solomon, who was set up after David, did build a house to the Lord, viz. the temple at Jerusalem, but the Messiah has never as yet built any such house. Before the temple was built, and when Solomon was giving orders to Hiram, Concerning the material for its construction, he said, um, Bob's note here, uh, if any of you are familiar with the Masonic Lodge, their little, um, well, the Masonic Lodge's purpose is basically the rebuilding of Solomon's temple. And they have the, uh, Secrets of Hiram and all this other stuff. I mean, it's it's just, you know, uh, why do why do they want to build a temple with hands and help the you know who's do animal sacrifice, blood sacrifice? Uh, you know, they make the crucifixion, Christ's sacrifice on the cross of no effect it's basic it's a denial it's a denial of christ and what he did on the cross denial so the masonic lodge is basically uh you know who ism for gent tiles yeah yeah it's terrible you got talking c o d e yeah pretty sad really all right so but when Solomon was giving orders to Hiram concerning the material for the temple's construction he said behold I purpose to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God as the Lord spake unto David my father saying thy son whom I shall set upon thy throne in thy room he shall build a house unto my name that is in first Kings 5 and 5 1 Kings 5.5. 5. Um, and by the way, Bob's note here, Hiram um, took cedars, cedar trees from Lebanon. Uh, cedar is a wood. Uh, I don't think it rots. It's very rot resistant. I believe it grows in like swamps and stuff. Also, termites do not like cedar. They will not they don't like it. Perhaps you've heard of cedar oil. Uh, women will take cedar chips uh, in a bag and put it in a closet, and it'll keep the moths out too. They don't, uh-uh. Ooh, no, no, no. We don't like the smell of this stuff. We're out of here. You know, cedar oil. And uh, cedar trees. The cedars of Lebanon, perhaps you've heard of them. Very famous, right? They're probably not around anymore but they used to be very 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 tall trees Hiram had his people cut the trees and um, I think they floated them down to uh, the land and then transported them over land I'm not sure exactly but something on something like that but uh, yeah the cedars of Lebanon and uh, you know, that's why they were Freemasons. They were stone masons. You know, the the lodge. Yeah. All right. 
Keep reading. Also, when the temple was finished, Solomon, Solomon standing before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and with uplifted hands spread toward heaven in the wonderful prayer at the dedication of the temple said, The Lord hath performed his word that he spake, and I am risen up in the room of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised in a built-in house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. There is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath, who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servant, who has kept with thy servant David, my father, that which thou promised him. Thou speakest also with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thine hand as it is this day. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel. And that's in 1 Kings 8, 20-25. By this prayer we see that Solomon understood that the throne, the kingdom, and the lineal house of David should stand forever. Solomon not only understood it this way, but declared it before all the congregation of Israel so that the entire nation should be fully aware of the fact uh, that this was so thoroughly known in Israel and acknowledged by our prophets that at the time of the division of the race into two kingdoms in the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, Abijah in his zeal that the lineal rights of the royal family might not be ignored, stood upon a mountain in Ephraim and cried out, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever and to his sons, plural, sons, not son, not one, but many, by a covenant of salt. And evidently that's in First Kings. I'm not sure where that's at. It doesn't tell you. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't tell me what chapter and book it's in. Uh, the marginal reading is a perpetual covenant. Perpetual means forever. In case you don't know it, perpetual means forever you ever heard of a perpetual motion machine yeah you know uh, the so-called pastors want you to think that uh dave you know the davidic covenant died when israel went into captivity and all that so the uh the, 80, the 89th Psalm contains much light regarding the covenant under consideration which the Lord made with David and his sons, sons concerning the perpetuity of his throne, scepter, kingdom, and his posterity. In it, the Lord declares, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant, saying, Thy seed will I establish forever. And build up thy throne to all generations, not a few, not some, not even many, but all generations. Continuing, he says, My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Uh, Bob's note, stripes as in uh, a whip. When you get hit with a whip, it leaves a mark like a stripe. You know, tiger has stripes. Yeah. When you get beaten with a whip, it leaves stripes. So, you know, that's what it's talking about here. 
Um, let's see. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. So God's not going to break his promise to David. Surely it is not possible to break the force of these words. The proposition could not be stated in stronger terms. The Lord simply will not break his covenant. He will not change nor modify nor in any way or for any reason alter the thing which he had spoken. Even if the children of David do forsake his law and break every commandment in his statute book, if they do break his laws, he will chastise and punish them with the rod and with stripes, but he will not suffer his faithfulness to fail. The covenant is unconditional. It shall stand fast. No matter how often they are visited with rod and stripe for their transgressions, no matter how severe the punishment, the fact remains that the throne, the scepter, the kingdom, and the seed must endure forevermore. The fact that this is the confirmation of the Davidic covenant, the Lord uses the expression, his children, they and their, all in the plural form is proof that this covenant does not have reference to the spiritual reign of his son, Jesus Christ, in the hearts of Christians. Bob's note here. That's what they say. Oh, the Davidic covenant, you know, Jesus rules and reigns in our hearts. That's the Billy Graham, Billy Goat Graham garbage. Throw it in the garbage. Don't listen to them. They're devils. Graham is a common you-know-who name. It rhymes with news and starts with a J. You know, like the month of July? Yeah. 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 Not J-U-L-Y, but yeah. Yeah. You, I, I, I think you get the idea. Furthermore, it is not possible that Jesus Christ, he of whom the prophet Isaiah wrote, saying, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, whose name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We say it is not possible for this Prince of Peace, who is the Mighty God, to break his own commandments, forsake his own laws, or disregard his own statutes, and then punish himself for his own wickedness. No. These warnings do not apply to the immortal one, but to the frail mortal sons of David, of whom Solomon was the first, and whom the Lord punished for his wickedness, as we may learn by referring to the 11th chapter of 1 Kings, when we read as follows. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and it commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Forasmuch as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it unto thy servant, notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it, for David my father, thy father's sake, but will rend it out of thy hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdoms, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake. 1 Kings 2, 9 through 13. Please notice how perfectly the facts agree in every detail. With the declared purpose of God, Solomon, the seed of David, who was set up after him, who sat on the throne in the room of his father, who built and dedicated the house of the Lord, did forsake his God and refused to obey his commandments. If God is true to his word, he must punish any of the children of David who thus forsook, who thus forsake his law. So as a punishment to Solomon, he purposes to take the greatness and power of the kingdom away from that son who as Solomon hopes, shall inherit the throne, crown, scepter, and kingdom in all his glory. But no, 
The Lord purposes to take away the greater part of the national strength and power of the kingdom and give it to one of the servants of Solomon instead of the royal heir. But while the Lord is declaring unto Solomon the punishment which he purposes to visit upon him for his disobedience, he is careful to say, Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son. Why not rend away all the kingdom? The divine reply is, for David my servant's sake. Why for David's sake? Because the Lord gave the kingdom over Israel to David and his sons forever. Ah, he dare not take away the entire kingdom from that royal line. Yes, we can say dare not and emphasize it too. And we may also add must not, cannot, or any and all such expressions as will voice our protest or express the impossibility of such a thing. Indeed, the Lord himself has uttered a strong protest than ours could ever be. We say this because the Lord, in his psalm, which we have under consideration after saying, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips, has in the very next statement made use of the words, which forever shut the door of retreat. For he not only took an oath in which he pledged his own holy character, but he brought the physical universe into the contract, or at least the portion of it which involves the continued existence of the present arrangement of our solar system. His declarations are, Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever, as the moon and as a faithful witness is in the heaven. That's in Psalms 89, verses 35 through 37. In other words, as long as the moon's in the sky at night, God will keep his promise. Also in the 29th verse of that same Psalm is the following. His seed also will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. If we are willing to give these words their full and natural meaning, then surely we, we must see clearly that it is in the intention of the Lord that we shall understand so long as the sun, the great light, which he created for a light by day, and the moon, the lesser light, which he created to rule by night, shall keep their appointed places in the heavens, traveling their orbits, continuing to make their proper changes, passing through their eclip ecliptics, and completing their lunatations, just so long must they rise over, shine down upon, and set beyond the limits of a kingdom on this earth, over which some member of the Judah Davidic family is holding the scepter. So long, just so long as they continue to say by their very presence in the heaven, we must witness unto men throughout all generations that the Lord God of Israel has not lied into his servant David. Furthermore, it is certain that the expression days of heaven and a faithful witness in heaven as used in these scriptures are purely, purely astronomic and refer to the stellar and atmospheric heavens. Hence, the throne, kingdom, scepter, and family of David must endure as the days of heaven. I.e., so long as the earth continues to... Uh, revolve on its own axis, thus giving to itself that diurnal motion uh, that has reference to day and night, uh, that diurnal motion which causes day and night to succeed each other and which enables the sun and moon to perform their function of lighting the day and night. But, says one, do not these sayings apply to the kingdom and the throne in heaven where Christ, the seed of David, is now sitting at the right hand of God? And is not the new Jerusalem which is above and is the mother to us all, the celestial capital of that kingdom? To this we are compelled to give a 
Negative answer. For that celestial city has no seed, no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for it is the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And that's in Revelation 21 and 23. But, questions another persistent spiritualizer. Do not the seed and throne mentioned in these scriptures refer to Christ, who is the son of David in his spiritual kingdom, which is set up in the hearts of men? Again, we are compelled to reply in the negative, for the Holy Ghost is the divine illuminator of that kingdom, the sun and moon having never been heavenly lights, only in an astronomical sense. Furthermore, a mere glance at the context will reveal the fact that the Lord is dealing with a very earthly seed and kingdom for intermingled with the promises of an everlasting seed, throne, and kingdom. The declaration is made concerning the children of David that if they do not walk in his statutes and judgments and commandments, but forsake his law and break his statutes, then he will visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But still, no matter how wicked the ruler on the throne or the subject in the realm, he will not suffer his faithfulness to fail. His covenant with David must stand forevermore. Hmm. The only conditions All right, so uh, let's see. The only conditions to this covenant are much as are entirely beyond the power of man either to control or to break uh, is the faithfulness of God in keeping and fulfilling his word, the holiness of his character, for he cannot lie, and the omnipotence of his power to keep the sun, the moon, and the earth rolling onward in their present cycles and order until by the good pleasures of his will he shall change those ordinances and bring into existence the new heavens and the new earth. Hence, the Holy Ghost has inspired Jeremiah to write, Thus saith the Lord, If ye can break my covenant of the day, and my covenant of the night, that there should not be day and night in their season. Then may also my covenant be broken with my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. That is in Jeremiah 33, 20 and verse 21. Previously in the same chapter, and in the 17th verse, the Lord has said, David shall never want or you know lack David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel in other words David's never gonna lack having a one of his descendants ruling over Israel then he adds the following if my covenant cannot uh, if my covenant be not with day and night and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This too after saying, As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant. Jeremiah 33, 22, 25, and 26. In the statement, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne. The word man is translated from the Hebrew ish which is defined as meaning a man, a person, a certain one, anyone. Ah, Bob's note here, ish. You ever heard of the uh, Danish, D-A-N-I-S-H? That means man of Dan, as in the tribe of Dan, Danish. Um, have you ever heard of the British, Brit, means covenant in Hebrew. So to be Brit British means to be a covenant man. Yeah. And they tell you that the you-know-whos are God's chosen people. Well, for hell, the lake of fire maybe. Um, but <laughs> British, covenant man, ish, I-S-H. 
yeah, you know, people, the, the, the truth is right under your nose. Or in, if you have a, 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 a true version of the King James Bible, it's in your hands, right? David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne. The word man is translated the Hebrew ish, which is defined as meaning a man, a person, a certain one, anyone. In the declaration that David should always have a son to reign on his throne, the Hebrew word, word from son is taken from ben, which means son, man or builder of the family name. You ever heard of Ben? Yeah. Ben. Um, yeah, it means son. This being the case together uh, with the fact that when duration of time is being considered, there are no stronger words in the Hebrew languages than those which are translated forever, evermore, and everlasting. Then the following prepositions must stand. The Lord God of Israel made a covenant with David concerning the perpetuity of his seed, throne, and kingdom, regardless of the good or evil conduct of his descendants. The subjects of this Davidic, Davidic covenant uh, kingdom must be belong to the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some person of the lineage of King David must be on that throne or seat of power, which holds a scepter and reigns over that kingdom. National afflictions will come upon them as punishment for their un unrighteousness, but they will not be utterly destroyed, for the kingdom must endure so long as there be day and night, and the subjects must continue to increase until they become innumerable. So long as the sun, moon, and earth continue rolling around in their appointed orbits, just so long must the seed thrown in Israelitish kingdom of David be in existence, or we have no longer a holy God ruling in the heavens and watching over Israel. In order to prove that God has become unholy, i.e. lied, some, uh, some men must yet find a fulcrum on which to rest his lever with which he can stop the rotation of the earth and then find some way to which he can drive those witnessing lights from the sky or in some way break up the appointed ordinance of heaven and earth so that there cannot be day and night in their season. Otherwise, the holiness and omnipotence of the God must be must not be questioned. Otherwise, the holiness and omnipotence of God must not be questioned. This is the reason that David so triumphantly says to him, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Psalms 138 and verse 2. The fact that God has thus magnified his word above his name would, in case of a failure on his part, to perpetuate that which he swears shall be in existence forever, gives us authority to impeach his testimony on every line, for it would undeify him. In other words, it would uh, dethrone him from being God. That is the end of chapter one of part two so absolutely um unbelievable that uh here you have people calling themselves doctor which is a minimum of eight years of bible college and they don't know this stuff well they probably do know this stuff well or maybe the lord hides it from them i don't know but how can you read the entire Bible and not know this stuff? You know? So the only other way, they have to be deceivers. There's just no other way around it, people. You know? There's just no other way around it. They're deceivers. So. All right. Well, this is Chaplain Bob. And um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.